Okay, so uh, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. Uh, and on today's chat, we're going to talk about a string, like literally one string, uh, the UA string. And we probably won't have enough time to talk about all the things that we want to talk about, which is weird to think about. So uh, we've invited on a fellow Egalian who has some relevant experience in this area and who I've had some interesting conversations with in the past that we thought would be good. So uh, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Alex, and uh, I have been working in this field on you know, browsers on Chromium since uh, 2013. Uh, so yeah, I witnessed some issues related <laughs> to the topic, to the UA strings. And yeah, it would be interesting to discuss them and probably to maybe speculate about the future of all the stuff around. All right, so uh, I'm gonna like I just want to introduce this in a in a kind of a strange way. I don't know if you um, if you both are familiar with this, but uh, maybe a decade ago, uh, Tony Horror gave a talk called uh, "Null Pointers: My Billion Dollar Mistake," <laughs> and it's just about like <laughs> all of the the like all of the work and problems and everything created by this one decision, very particular way he handled, you know, the problem that was created by null pointers and like all of the things that were caused by that. And I kind of feel like there's something here. I'm like, I'm not saying it was a mistake necessarily, but um, really it's shocking how much time and effort and money has been spent discussing the UA string <laughs> and, and actions. So um, I thought it would be cool if we had like maybe a little history. Um, uh, yeah. Eric, do you want to like give us a little history? I mean, I, I can give a very brief sketch. Like you said, a full discussion would take much longer than we have. But uh, the UA string or the user agent string, user agent being W3C speak for web browser, basically. Although it can mean a lot more than that. But again, another thing that we don't have enough time to really dive into. But the... The string is the thing that the browser sends, that the user agent sends, but the browser sends to the server to say, this is who I am, right? And going all the way back to like the first HTTP uh, specifications, it said, in, a, in effect, it said, browsers can identify themselves for you know purposes of tracking, uh, not tracking in the sense of following people, but tracking what browsers are being used, right? Um, or what user agents are being used so that a server administrator could possibly look in their server logs and say, oh, this is a new user agent. I should go see what that's about. Um, and they started out really simple, right? And basically saying, I am this browser in this with this version number. And then over time, uh, they started to uh, evolve a little bit into, I am this browser with this version number on this operating system, sometimes they would say. Um, although <laughs> many of the first uh, web browsers were one platform only. So in a lot of cases, they didn't bother to identify the platform because there was there was never any uh, ambiguity about that. If you saw Cello show up in your user agent logs, that meant that it was a Windows machine because Cello was only available on Windows. Uh, like as we'll see, a lot of the things that yeah happen here are like about reasoning at a point in time right right yeah for a lot of years people would have been like well the 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 microsoft browser only runs on windows right until suddenly that's <laughs> yeah no longer true right? right until internet explorer for the macintosh exactly right. right and now you can get edge for every platform right more or less so. right so eventually you know browsers did start to say you know at least some of them in the user agent string started to say you know this is who I am. And also, this is the operating system I'm on. But then it got weird. They started saying, oh, you know, I'm going to look at the user agent string. And if you're on this browser, then I will give you this page. And if you're on this other browser, I will give you, you know, something different. The HTTP spec, the first one, like says that it could be used for tailoring the HTTP response. Yep to get around limitations because yes. that was that was foreseen right because right. um browsers were getting 
much better, but we still had a line mode browser. Uh, if you have something that is super capable, maybe like the line mode browser isn't, but you should still serve them, right? Yeah. Uh, honestly, I learned a few points from the discussion and uh, I didn't know the full history of the US string in details, but uh, what looks kind of a summary to me is that on one hand, the UI string is used more or less for the purposes which were designed initially because it was invented uh, to allow the servers to decide what to send to the client. So the client would identify itself using the UA string and the server would decide how to serve this particular client based on that. But the original intent, the initial intent, uh, probably did some turns which were not anticipated. And the entire thing evolved into something much more complicated and uh, maybe even to some extent harmful or dangerous because it turned into something which started to limit some clients from getting the content which they are uh, which they deserve to to get that's the idea i don't know who the first i don't know i don't know which browser was the first to start lying i remember clearly opera doing it ah it was microsoft it was microsoft internet explorer so, okay as you say like they were very simple to begin with like mm -hmm. there were two tokens that according to the spec, they, they followed the spec. They were like, what is the name of your browser? Mm -hmm. And like, what is the version engine operating system kind of clarity token at the, the second part? Right. Um, and uh, what happened there is uh, Netscape very early uh, got a ton of funding. That, that's arguably what made people sit up and really take notice of the web. Right. Uh, their IPO was ginormous. <laughs> and they threw all that money at development and they began making a really good browser. Um, yeah. So they supported notably JavaScript was a right. thing and frames and all kinds of new, like it was the best browser hands down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, developers began saying, well, uh, we'll send the, the nice frame stuff to Mm. ones that identify themselves as Mozilla. That was the, the product token name for even for Netscape back then, because it wanted to be a mosaic killer. Um, and if to everyone else, uh, we'll send like a stripped down version, really more basic. Right. Or um, a, or a, your browser does not support this. Go download the browser that supports this. Page. Yeah. So the interesting thing, though, is that Microsoft found that they were in dilemma because that's really when they entered the game and they, they started really pouring some money into development. Um, right. They got people from Mosaic, like Chris Wilson, with the intent of being really competitive. And Microsoft's next browser was frames capable. But now, even if they push the browser onto people's operating systems, like that requires people to use the browser and for them to have a good experience and then switch. Right. Right. The trouble is that no website would send it the good website. They would all send it right. the, the stripped down website. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a catch 22. And so, um, so browsers started lying about who they were basically in order to not have that happen to them, uh, as they advanced in, in capability. Right. Because, if a later version of Internet Explorer supports that stuff, but the sites aren't being updated, right? Because either somebody put them up <clears throat> and just left them there, or they don't realize that Internet Explorer has shipped a more capable new version or whatever. doesn't matter. Sites aren't being updated. And so, yeah, like, you know, like, like you were saying, Brian, you, the, the browser basically had to say, well, I'm Internet Explorer, but I'm also going to tell you that I'm Mozilla. 
Yeah, that's the really interesting thing. And the way that they did that is by looking at the spec and how people were parsing the string based on the spec. Yeah. So uh, the first one is supposed to be the product token, the first part. Um, And up until that point, everybody was just honest. They would say, we're Mozilla, we're Mosaic, we're the line mode browser. (laughs) Um, But in IE2, uh, when Microsoft realized this, Uh, They cheated. They claimed that they were Mozilla. (laughs) Right. Uh, So that people would send them the good content. But then in the the, the second portion, which has like all the clarifying information about your OS and stuff, um, Mm -hmm. they said, uh, well, we're compatible, actually, (laughs) in parentheses. And then that they were Mm. Microsoft IE2. Right. So you have to lie to get the content. But you also still have to identify yourself because we need, we like the purpose of the string is in part for statistics, right? Yep. Um, so that's important, right? Right. Yeah. Because because cause Internet Explorer doesn't want to just say, oh, we're Mozilla, because then it looks like Mozilla has 100% market share instead of at the time, you know, 95% or whatever. Right. But whatever it is, if you just lie and don't actually say who you are, then nobody can tell that your browser is being being used. Yeah, uh, you want to so. change that, right? right. You want to change yeah. that narrative and mm-hmm. get a little bit of the the tail wags the dog. Right. So uh, you have to identify yourself. So they just kind of found a clever way to th- slip through the regex crack. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. Um, yeah, by saying, hey, we're Mozilla. And then, oh, uh, by the way, we're, we're actually Internet Explorer. And the sort of quote unquote nice knock-on of this if you are microsoft internet explorer is that uh if you do change the narrative and you you can turn the tables right like as you said we like this new feature in ie and so we will send the good stuff to ie and Mm -hmm. something less to everyone else uh if you can you know manage to get the good new features and you know beat to market and and change the narrative then you can also create a runaway scenario and so that is also indeed what happened yeah. where uh, Microsoft did become a really good browser. Um, they did kind of win. And so um, this is really like just wash, rinse and repeat, right? I mean, this is yeah. just, uh, it just keeps happening where people make websites and they find that they want to use some feature they're trying to kind of do the right thing in a way a lot of times like they they still want to send content Mm -hmm. Um, but even if they do that decision is sort of locked in time and then a new browser comes along that they hadn't considered or Mm -hmm. a new os is available for that browser and you had reason that it was only available on one os what ends up happening is every time there's a new browser we have to concoct a new way to find the holes in the current predominant regex parse yeah and by the time you get to chrome version one in 2008 it looks something like this mozilla slash 5.0 parentheses windows semicolon u semicolon windows nt 51 semicolon en us and parentheses space apple webkit uh which then in parentheses khtml like gecko uh space chrome version space safari and it's like, okay, what is that? Yeah. Like, what Frankenstein monster is that? It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> right. It lists every engine and every browser that had been prominent in people's regular expression checking of user agent strings, basically, that had accreted over the years. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. And, and, and it, yeah, it went back and forth because, you know, at a certain point, um, like you said, the Internet Explorer became dominant. Yeah. And then people started parsing user agent strings looking to send the best stuff to Internet Explorer. And so Netscape had to munge up its user agent string in order to in order to get the good stuff. And yeah, that's how you end up with that enormous list of, you know, it's almost it's fascinating how the user agent string now is it's it's almost a, a, a historical document. Right. You you can you can sort of look at it the way archaeologists look at like compressed layers of sediment 
in, Definitely. in, a, in a cutaway. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, in California at an event. I think it was uh, Blink On or Chrome Dev Summit with a bunch of Egalians. And I was there uh, after hours in the cafeteria uh, having pizza with Alex and Yvonne, who, who used to be here, now works at Brave. And somehow the topic turned to some things about a UA string and uh, work that had to be done and sort of pains that were caused by things. And I, I was like totally unaware of this aspect uh, of UA strings. And so I was wondering, maybe I can throw it to Alex to describe it. Yeah, the situation with uh, the US string and the issues around it, it is complicated. But I think the Chromium browser and its family of browsers derived from it, like the Google Chrome first, then some uh, major forks, like, for example, the Samsung Internet, or, for example, Yandex Browser, yeah, or some other uh, forks like Brave or like Opera now. And actually, there are many, many browsers based on Chromium. And what issue they all face? That, for example, there are some resources, some websites, which expect you to come there with Chrome. And other browsers forked from Chromium, they want to distinguish themselves from the family. So they, they would have the separate separate line in the stats or something like this. But then they, they get discriminated by the system because it expects Chrome or Chromium, but not Samsung Internet and not Opera and not Yandex Browser and not whatever else. Uh, there are literally dozens of browsers based on Chromium. And that's the issue. The, the UI string in this regard turned into the instrument of limiting the system and limiting the users. So you come to, to some website using the browser based on Chromium, which is totally capable of everything which is required, but you are rejected because it doesn't expect the fork. It expects the Chromium or Chrome. Now that's the issue. The solution is kind of obvious. Every major browser which wants to have its separate line in the stats, sooner or later they come to this, that on certain resources, on certain websites, they have to say that they are Chrome. Probably they just have a fixed set of some domains or maybe URLs where they send the fake UI, UA string. Uh, this is called the user agent spoofing. And I, I cannot tell for sure, but I'm pretty sure that every browser has it kind of implemented more or less the same way. Yeah, so that, that was the bit of the conversation that I was previously unaware of. Um, so to be, to be really clear, if you create a new browser today, you aren't going to get a lot of content on important websites, like things will not work unless you tell an elaborate UA string lie, <laughs> right? Not, not a lie, a, a series of lies. Like, uh, like Eric <laughs> said, it's like layers, like archeological layers of lies that you have to tell. Um, but what I was previously unaware of before that point is that's only sort of the first layer of lies. Uh, there are more lies uh, in which a, you you can't fall through all of the cracks. There are websites, like important, like Alexa websites or something, you know, like Alexa top websites that are, you know, critical to people's lives, but that the WebKit team has no power to make them change and send them the good content or let them through the door. But any other lie that they tell will mess up other sites. And so in those cases, straight up spoofing <laughs> right like safari will just be like i'm chrome it would be interesting to measure somehow the amount the share of websites which want only some certain browsers to come the summary of the idea is that only a small maybe even teeny segment of internet is that sensitive uh for the version for the user agent 
So maybe, maybe the problem is not that huge. Uh, it only affects some certain points in the huge graph of, of the internet. I don't know. So it will, it would be interesting to, to measure it somehow. I don't know. How. I, I also think that, which is why I started diving into some of this. So, uh, there's another layer to this, which is that, um, you're right. Like the ones that any browser has to lie to is a relatively small list. Uh, their list of domains or subdomains uh, where you just straight up lie. But th there's another layer to this where uh, you have to tell a smaller lie, <laughs> uh, where th you send the right UA string uh, that's packed, just jam packed with lies, but still properly identifies you. But then again, for some important Alexa site, uh, where some in time reasoning happened, like it won't work unless you do something that was true at a time. And so like, there are also things where like, um, say this particular domain, you have to like force it into quirks mode, or you have to cause this really particular behavior that was like a side effect that somebody was using to determine something uh, in their code path that would cause it to blow up otherwise. it Now, again, though, like it is not, as Alex said, it's not like this astronomical list of a million domains. It's like a relatively small number that there are workarounds in there for. And there are workarounds really, I think, mainly because they are like top sites. They're ones that like a lot, a really lot of people use those and you will have a bad impression of this browser if it just doesn't work with those websites uh, lots of people will notice those but smaller than that there's things like you know your website or my website or maybe you know a, a company that we work with that has an internet that you know smaller scale kinds of things and uh, it's an interesting question of like, how does it affect those? One of the interesting things is that people don't not care about this. Like they do. Um, we have questions about how we want to tailor something in response to maybe all kinds of things. Sometimes they're workarounds. Uh, loading polyfills is, is a big one. Like how do you know which polyfills to load? If you know which browser, you can you can kind of build an index of those and send down the right ones. I think like the polyfill as a service kind of does this. But uh, even CMSs have these things that simplify it. They don't make you look at the UA string, but they let you say like, if it's an iPad, you show it like this, or you give it this style sheet, <laughs> or you give it this HTML. And if it's like a second generation iPad, then you do it like this or something, right? The way that it's achieving those is really through the UA string. And this, as you can imagine, it's the UA string has gotten a lot more information and more complicated. There are whole industries built around this. There's this uh, what's my browser.com that claims to have over 150 million unique UA strings in the wild. It has this database that breaks it down and <laughs> like says this one indicates like, you know, a second generation iPad with this kind of chipset, <laughs> you know, like it, it's really this huge database of meta information that these other products use to make it palatable for you to like do useful things. Like there are absolutely useful things, but as you get more vectors of information, you also create this privacy problem because <laughs> that's getting to be pretty specific at that point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, so this is, this is a problem and it's like, it's, it's a problem on like many, many levels. So Safari who has been like leading on privacy a lot um, for a long time, like they're the first ones that just got rid of third party cookies. And they also began treating the UA string as kind of a vector for just wanton too much information sharing, you know, and they began limiting the string. They had some problems. They made some adjustments. I think Mozilla also followed in. Now Chrome has efforts around this too. And like how we maybe take this out of a string so it doesn't need to be full of lies, uh, how we freeze it, 
there's also conversations. There's a couple of blog posts from both Mozilla and Chrome that are about what happens when we reach version 100. There's a, a little bit of a worry that there might be like a, a parser Y2K bug sort of <laughs> where. Yeah, in part because that happened when when browsers went to version 10. Right, right. I mean, so it's like. It's already know, happened once. <laughs> back in the days when we were talking about it needs to look good in the 4.0 browsers. They're like reaching version 100 seemed like a thing that would not happen in our lifetimes. Yeah. Back, back in the day there was this, this whole evergreen, like release a new version every six weeks cycle is a relatively new invention. I mean, it's been around for quite a few years now, but it's relatively new. And yeah, but it used to be that you could literally go a couple of years between a version release and I don't, and we're not talking about a major version release, like between 5.0 and 5.1, it could be 18 months, it could be yeah, two years. Yeah. And of course, then there was also the time that internet Explorer just went away for five years. Exactly. But, right. Yeah. Like some of the outfall of that is like, even as they want to make these changes, there are like groups in the industry that like stand up and say, yeah, wait a minute, we have an entire business model based on this. And we think, it can be used for all sorts of useful things. Look, it's been in the HTTP spec since the very beginning right. to do useful things. And like, what is not useful about that? Those are useful things. And, you know, I mean, they're not wrong. You can do useful things, right? But you can also make decisions that make a lot of sense in the moment, but then perpetuate right. this kind of problem. Yeah, Just make it harder and kick it further down the road, but also begin to create some real privacy tracking issues. So it's, it's an interesting set of problems. And it, it's, I think, Alex, you're right, that it would be interesting to know how many sites are affected by something about the UA string. And I would say more than you think, I bet, uh, somehow, because it is used for loading polyfills, it is used for directing, it is used for... I mean, it's used for everything and it's used for everything on both ends. Like we said, for planning, how important that market share is because I, all of these products have a, a problem with funding as we've talked about like a number of times, which is like, they're largely funded privately by one or two companies with completely independently for different reasons. And, you know, they have to make the case for budget and they have to convince right. users to use their product. And like knowing the stats definitely plays mm -hmm. into both ends of that. Um, if you're Samsung internet and like, you're going to have a really hard time getting budget. Right. But if you show that, you know, like you were at 1% a few years ago and then you got to 3% and now you're at 6%, like that looks like success you can build on mm -hmm. and you yeah. will get more budget. Right. The fact that then that breaks into news stories and there's more and more people who can share with you like, oh, I use Samsung Internet. It's really good. It's good for privacy. You get a lot of people out there evangelizing it. That's then also good for feeding that cycle and getting more users. We know that we build trust through relationships. Like if Eric recommends a browser to me, I'm like, maybe I'll try that browser, right? <laughs> Even if I've never heard of it, I'm going to go look into it and maybe try it. Samsung was being miscounted once we fixed all the things that counted them. And we don't even know if they're all fixed yet, <laughs> but it's the third most used browser in mobile in the world by a wide margin. If you're building a website and you're treating it like that, you're making some discretion there for even something as simple as like sending polyfills, you will be wrong if you think that Samsung internet is Chrome. Right. Like they're not the same. They have different features. They have different yeah. holes that you need to fill or or landmines that you need to avoid. You know, this looks a bit like a paradox. It does. It does feel incredibly hard to unwind. On one hand, uh, we are interested. So competition is good for everyone. But on the other hand, when so many, 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 many clones of and forks and versions are out there, it is, again, not really good and very hard to to handle, you know? So to, to the webmaster has to be aware of dozens of versions and brands and their possible incompatibilities or some minor issues like this browser 
supports this feature a bit incorrect way or something like this. So it's kind of the the backside of the competition. <laughs> Too many competitors and it's it becomes a very complicated thing. So yeah, like a, a way that this ties directly to something that we've been in working on and we've been involved with is like, uh, you know, these, these things have affected um, like Epiphany. There's a bunch of stuff in there about uh, Epiphany and WPE, like what what do you send and do you get the right content? And uh, if you send a string and you don't get the good content, the right content, good and right even <laughs> is an interesting thing. Uh, what does that mean in some cases? People will blame your browser and they will say like, this browser is no good, I don't wanna use it. Even though maybe the browser is good <laughs> and it's not, it's the website's fault. So uh, a, a really direct recent thing is Agalia took over the project that was formerly known as Firefox Reality, and we're now creating a browser out of the same guts of that um, called Wolvik. And that's for AOSP-based standalone XR devices uh, and Harmony OS tethered systems. So that's like Meta Quest now, I guess it's called, too. And like Huawei VR glasses and, and things like that. You know, we've been doing testing like we have a bunch of websites that have xr stuff like they're linked to in a lot of places we go we look at them and there are like not a small number of them that like they present this enter vr button or they shove you into like a mobile mode or a desktop mode based on something in the ua string and so when will it comes along they shove us into the wrong mode or they don't present the enter VR. We can't make all those sites change, yeah. you know? And e even if we could somehow compel them, like, you know, they have lives, you know, like they can't drop everything and fix their website right now. So we can release the product. <laughs> yeah. Even, even if we had a hundred percent buy-in and you never do. <laughs> In fact, the, the, I mean, this all reminds me of the whole doc type switching and standards mode and quirks mode in in CSS, right? It's a it's a very very similar things happened here. And when I was when I was at Netscape, way way long ago, the reason the almost quirks rendering mode exists is there was a an Alexa top ten site that had a, a rendering quirk. So they were relying on a, basically a, a quirks mode behavior, and we reached out to them and, and got contact like got in touch with them and said, Hey, this is happening. You know, we're, we're moving to a more standards based model, like with other browsers. And here's how you would like literally just change the doc type on your pages and it'll fix this problem. And they said, no, fix your browser. They literally refused and several rounds of, Hey, no, it was really, it's very simple. They're like, yeah, no, it... we're, we're not interested. Go away. And that's why almost standards mode exists in, in doc type parsing, even if you could find contact information for everybody, which you of course never can, it, you, you're still gonna, it's gonna be years before everything is up to date. Yeah, another aspect of this that like hits on the other side is that if you're unlucky enough to work for one of those domains that has the, the, the lie, you know, like has one of these lies that like is like, well, we're gonna identify ourselves properly and everything, but based on the fact that at one point in time, you know, it was required that we tell you this little, this little lie about some quirk that you were looking into and shove you into quirks mode or whatever, right? And you don't know that. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm going to write something that's like the latest and greatest. And like you, you can work on it locally and it works great. And you can deploy it to some server that doesn't have the domain in it. It works great. And then you deploy it to like, a server that does have a domain and suddenly, you know, <laughs> a chair in a different room falls over. Like, you know, uh, and you're like, what is happening? And it's really, it, it can be really hard to get out of, but yeah, I mean, that's what, like what kind of led me to be really interested in this is that, you know, Alex, you said competition is good for everybody, right? Like there's an aspect of this that's like related to evolution, right? So we have like a predator and prey relationship here. We have this adversarial system that we've built where like 
there are benefits on many sides that are sometimes like at odds with one another over the long run. You know, on the one side, we we get past this thing and it's better for everybody. And then on the other side, we find a new way to game it. And then we get a little bit more information and we find new things that we can do. And then we decide, well, we shouldn't have let that happen. We need to tone that back. But now there's industries built around that. And it, it's very interesting to see how you build up complexity this way um, through, you know, sort of not intentionally adversarial, but things that wind up being like a adversarial model, what causes evolution, you know? Yeah, actually, in in a philosophical uh, way, I would summarize this, uh, like, for for evolution, some imbalance is required. So it, it can take different forms. Sometimes it's yeah, hunter and the prey. Sometimes it's something else, but always, if we if we balance everything, if we kind of reach some stable point, evolution stops or slows down. So, yeah. Interesting about this is that there's aspects of this where we would really like that to slow down or stop, <laughs> and other ones where maybe not, because they're actually really useful. Yeah, so, I mean, given all of this, given this history and the the current state of things and, and the sort of weird place we find ourselves in, I guess my question is what's next or what should be next if those are different things, right? Like, like what's, what's going to happen with user agent strings moving forward and should there be like, like what, what would our ideal result be over the long term? What do you think, Alex? Well, I think there are many ideas, but to me it looks like. So what what is the problem in in a few in a few words? Uh, the problem is that the the UA the UA string is used for many purposes at once, and we can tell at least two purposes. One is statistics, and the other one is capabilities. And to me, as the engineer. Uh, the maybe most straightforward way to resolve this would be or could be decoupling the things and using different different uh, maybe APIs to handle the different purposes. So probably it would be better to decouple the stats completely from exchanging the content, you know? So probably we could have the stats as a separate feature, maybe even at the level of some infrastructure of the internet, so that the browser would send it separately from the request to content to some separate parties. At the same time, uh, of course, it, can, it cannot be done totally independent from, from the website, because we need to gather stats uh, of which browser comes to which page, right? And that is why we need to to tie it somehow so that the stats are sent when the browser comes to some page and maybe opens it with some some parameters or whatever I don't know. Uh, so probably, uh, so what is what is the the current way of doing this? Uh, there are, for, for example, some so-called uh, internet trackers which are teeny things embedded into the page, which just uh, make the browser doing a request to some, some resource, and there they, they record the UA string. So probably for this purpose of, uh, making, uh, of gathering the stats in a new way, the browsers could have some API, which the page or some third party would request in a way untouchable and uh, unmodifiable by the main page so that it would have the channel for gathering the statistics which would be independent from the website and which could not be affected by the page and that way the browsers would not be interested in spoofing so they could just send something maybe similar to the ui, UI string but 
which would only serve this very purpose of gathering the statistics. Well, there's a lot happening in this space, and the groups are like uh, kind of some slowly coming together, uh, like on the different things and cross checking one another and everything. Definitely, things will happen here. So, one of the ideas here is to limit the UA string that's sent by default. So there's there's a a real problem here that the UA string is like sent the complete UA string with all of its data is sent all the time to everyone. I have no negotiation part in that and no way to, to track it or if users wanted to block it or whatever, like it's very difficult to do. So like one of the suggestions that seems to have some legs is that we need to really pare down what's sent in there and create sort of the simplest possible minimal information again initial request there is a an effort for ua client hints that is um along these lines it like breaks down from one string to many smaller strings where there's no parsing involved you get separate pieces of data so we can maybe stop mm -hmm. the parsing lies um and then we can send an initial request that has very little information and then do some negotiation about which headers you would like to transmit and send somehow uh, and make that an active thing. And then there's also bits in there that are about like entropy and everything. Um, but one of the challenges there is like, there's no guarantee that just having separate fields doesn't mean that we'll just wind up with <laughs> right. new lies in different places. There isn't a good sense really of the question that Alec asked about like, well, how many things are affected by this somehow? I don't know. What do you think, Eric? What? There were so many things that were, that were done and that we've in, we now have the hindsight to see were bad ideas. And, you know, I know that HTTP was designed from the outset to, to enable some of these things. Mm -hmm. But I think what we've learned is that, that that is a tool that people will use to, to cut, not only themselves, but their users' experience. We're certainly not going to solve it here today. No, um, but I, I do think like it, it is really interesting because I, like Alex was saying, I don't know what the effect of it is, but it is certainly a lot. Like there's so many aspects of this where the UA string is used, and if we just suddenly stopped sending all of it, I bet a whole bunch of things would go wrong. Probably on many, many levels. So it, it's interesting to figure out how we how we tame this beast somehow. So, yeah, I think it's it's been an interesting conversation. Um, I'm going to post a blog about this as well. Yeah, it, it's interesting to think where it will go. Thanks for having the conversation. Yeah. And Alex, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the really interesting and uh, educating chat and yeah i hope that we will have some follow-up yeah thank you sir